All right, church, let's come on back to the sanctuary. Come on back. Begin the service. Well, not begin, but continue the service. So, by the way, thank you so much for all the birthday wishes. Um, I'm so thankful that at age 51, I feel like I'm like 21. So, uh, feel good. Um, what? Yeah, Drake birthday gift, no power. Yeah, yeah. So. I found out I share a birthday with my favorite actor, uh, Bradley Cooper. So I didn't know that actually until, like, uh, I actually looked it up. Well, I didn't look it up. Like, I'm stalking him or something like that. But I just, yeah, it just came up. So, all right. Let's go ahead and begin the service uh, again. Sorry, not begin, but continue the service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for giving us this time to be able to study your word. And as we continue this, this trek to kind of look at the uh, end time scenario, you would just continue to bless. Bless the hearing of your word. Bless us as we study eschatology. Bless us as we continue to know and learn about uh, the seasons in which we live in. Thank you so much for baptizing me afresh with the Holy Spirit and just continue your good work here at Calvary Chapel Stafford in 2022. In Jesus' name, amen. So, turn the Bibles to Revelation chapter 13, and then keep your, uh, like, uh, this little stringy thing there, and then go to Daniel chapter 12. As you guys know, we began, a, like, a, a study into the scenario of the end times last Sunday. Of course, Jesus condemned the Pharisees and the religious leaders for not knowing the season in which they live in. So it's very important that at some point in the year we, we cover some prop, well, prophecy stuff, right? And so we talked and we, we looked at the Olivet Discourse, which was in Matthew 24. We talked about the, the things in which Jesus said there because the, dis, the, the disciples came to him and said, Hey, uh, tell us, what will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so, of course, Jesus, you know, gave this incredible sermon called the Olivet Discourse. And he gave, like, uh, the, the conditions, like wars and rumors of wars and stuff like that. And so we look at that in depth. And so today, I want to take you first to Daniel chapter 12. Obviously, most of you guys know that you cannot understand the book of Daniel without understanding the book of Revelation, and you cannot understand the book of Revelation without understanding the book of Daniel, right? Just like you cannot understand me without understanding Jody, but you cannot understand Jody, well, period. So, anyway, so, uh, it's just getting out. <laughs> that just came out. Sorry, I'm in trouble. Anyways, um, Anyway, so here it is. Daniel, again, he prophesied some 35, 3,600 years uh, from today. So basically about 1,500 uh, years before Christ. And of course, no, no, actually 500 years before Christ. And so this guy was an amazing prophet. He was kind of like an official in the uh, uh, Babylonian and also the Persian Empire. So the time that we get there in his uh, book, chapter 12, he is at the tail end of his, uh, basically, uh, ministry, if you will, in his life. Now, if we look at verse 40 of chapter 11, it says, at the time of the end. So please understand that there's this, this time that is given to us that, uh, that, that the Bible speaks a lot about, and that is the time of the end. In fact, most prophecies in the Old Testament and the New is regarding this time of the end, which is given to us in Daniel chapter 9 about the 70th week of Daniel. So if you've not done a study on the, the 70th week of Daniel, you have to go there and do a study on that. So that's the last seven-year period in which we call uh, the, the tribulation or the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years. And of course, preceding that would be the rapture. And so Daniel speaks about this. Now, if you will, as we move on, verse 1, chapter 12 of Daniel, as it says, And at that time, Michael shall stand up, uh, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of his people. And there shall be a, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. 
So again, this time is going to be so perilous, as Paul puts it, okay? So notice now, verse 4. As Daniel is wrapping up this apocalyptic book, okay? It says this, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Because John is told in Revelation that he needs to open the books. Okay, so notice, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So again, this is at the time of the end, many will run when they're not being chased. Just kidding, you know, like joggers and all that. Anyway, so we're like the only like, time in the history of the world where people actually go jogging for no reason, right? Well, I guess the Greeks did it too. So anyways, but, but here it says the prophecy Many shall run to and fro. I know a lot of you guys know this prophecy because it's actually referred to a lot. But I love this so much because there's so many ways in which you could actually draw from this. There's so many ways in, you, you, in which it could be actually prophetically interpreted. First and foremost, to and fro, right? Running, right? Again, we, uh, I guess as a society, we take travel for granted. Marty's gone, he's probably in Minnesota or somewhere. He travels, he gets on a plane every single week. Most of us, for the holidays, we travel back to where we're from to, to kind of hang out with family and, it, you know, that's, that's our society, right? We have transcontinental flights and transatlantic uh, cruises or cruise liners and all these things. But for the most part, in the history of mankind, most people didn't do this, most people, lived and actually died within like miles of like where they were born. They didn't travel like we travel right now. So as Daniel begins to say that many will, will, will run to and fro. We see this today, even with cars and gas powered cars and even electric cars, we, we go to and fro. Whenever we want. In our nation, we have such freedom. We could go to another state whenever we want. We could go elsewhere in Europe, and, you know, traveling. So, gosh, even billionaires are taking millionaires up to, like, our, our upper stratosphere, whatever you want to call it, in space, right? That's traveling, right? Whether you're talking about SpaceX or Virgin Atlantic or, or even like a Blue Origin, right? With uh, Elon Musk and, and Richard Branson and, and Jeff Bezos, right? You have these billionaires that are taking millionaires up to space. And so traveling is like something that we, we've never ever seen like this. So we all know this. But traveling, that's just not the only way we can look at this because this phrase, again, we talk a lot in, in this uh, church about expositional constancy. That is the way that, that the Bible looks at one thing or uses a word or a phrase, it's usually the same way it uses it throughout the Bible. And so there's many, many places, about four other places in which the Bible uses the, the phrase to and fro. And so if you go to Job chapter 1, I'll just refer to one place. That is Job chapter 1. And there, verse 6, the day, uh, there was a day when, when the sons of God came to present themselves before God. And, and Satan came also, and God said to him, from where do you come? And Satan said to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So from going to and fro. So is that basically like a literal in which like uh, Satan actually was going and uh, crossing uh, the Atlantic and going to the Grand Canyon and, and, and seeing where the uh, site of the uh, Great Wall will one, uh, will one day be built? No. The phrase is an idiom. It, it, it describes uh, basically like, um, like, uh, like, like searching, if you will. Okay, so elsewhere, I believe four other places, Job 1 and Job 2, and I forget the other two places, but it, it, when, when this phrase, to and fro, is used, it's talking about searching. As Satan was searching for someone to devour, someone to accuse them uh, before God. That's what, that, that's what it's saying. That's why God says, 
have you considered my, my servant Job? And so again, it's, it, it's a phrase, it, it's like you know, when, we, when we talk about, uh, you know, maybe in the 80s, that phrase, oh, where are you going now? on the weekend? I'm, we're gonna go paint the town, right? Well, guess what? I painted the town a lot when I was young, but there was no murals that I left or anything. There was like, that's not what painting the town means, okay? Like when, when young people, not today because I don't think they use this, this phrase, but in my days when we said we go paint the town, we're not talking about a wall, we're gonna uh, you know, draw a mural of Christ or Martin Luther King, or whatever, no. We're talking about partying it up and drinking and having a good time, going clubbing, that's painting the town, right? Am, am I not right? Yeah. Just like you know, another phrase, hit the waves. If I see, for instance, in the morning, uh, Jody and I wake up and I say, hey, Jody, let's go hit the waves. I'm not talking about like, you know, going down to our basement and slapping weights around. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, right? that's, that's not what I'm talking about, hitting the weights, right? Um, talking about working out, right? And so again, there, there's these things that we are comfortable with, that we're familiar with. Well, going to and fro in the Bible is talking about searching. Searching, and then it says, to and fro, knowledge shall increase. So when you talk about knowledge and searching, all I can think about is like a search engine like Google. Think about it as how many of us grew up when we had to like do, do like a, a report. We were taught at a young age, like in, in freshman in high school or like in, in junior high, we were taught how to use a library and, and use the uh, Dewey Decimal System. Remember that Dewey Decimal System? And, and we had to go to that little, little shelf where all the cards of all the books are at, and we're supposed to look it up, and we're supposed to know it because of the number system, right? To find the books, right? That's how we did our research, you young people. And we would have to go get the book, and most likely we don't even know where the information we wanted is. So we have to read like the content, the, the table of content, to find out where to narrow it down, and then read that chapter to finally come to that place where we're like, that's where. And then we, you know, I did. I, I, I we're not supposed to write in the books. I get it, but I did because I wasn't about because I would lose the place. I would highlight it or write it or whatever, and then like fold the little, little dog ears and all these things. And when you return to the librarian, it's like, oh, oh, you're not supposed to do this. I'm like, oh, it wasn't me. Like, of course, I would never do that to a book. The books are sacred to me, right? Anyway, that's how we did it. But you guys are so, such cheaters. You guys just go to a Google search and what was Napoleon's uh, favorite drink, or something like that? You, you know, like, or like you ask Alexa or Siri, like you know, some question about George Washington. And of course, there it is, right? To and fro, knowledge, right? Searching, expositional constancy. That phrase is always talking about searching, searching knowledge. I'm telling you guys. This is spoken 3,500 years ago by Daniel. We had no clue of what a search engine was or even a combustible engine, right? As to and fro, he had no idea that there would be trains and automobiles and, and you could throw your mother off the, the train or something. What was that movie? Anyway, so, anyways, but there's no, no, no such thing as that, right? But he said it by faith. So again, this is such an incredible, incredible prophecy, some 3,500 years ago, in which they, they wrote mules and donkeys, right? At least the Jews did, and then the, uh, the, uh, the heathens, uh, they, they wrote horses and camels, right? Well, guess what? Another way to look at it. I love this. Because when you come to the, the phrase that knowledge shall increase, in the Hebrew, it's literally a definite article. That is, the knowledge shall increase. So you're going to search, and then the knowledge shall increase. Now, uh, I've heard people say that that's the Bible, right? That's the Bible. Knowledge and people will, will be searching, and I beg to differ. I believe the knowledge, as it's pointing out a specific thing, is not the Bible, but prophecy and prophetic stuff. Because I've always talked about this phrase, progressive prophetic revelation. 
that as we move closer and closer to the day in which we're going to be snatched up in the rapture, and then seven years later, Jesus comes in the second coming, as we move closer and closer, there's going to be more revelation as to what it is that we're going to see kind of come about with technology, with armies, and, and all the, with diseases. How many of you guys knew that when, when Jesus said uh, in Matthew 24 about pestilences, how many of you guys knew back in 2019 that there was going to be this COVID-19, this, or, uh, you know, whatever, Delta variant, whatever? Again, progressive pro prophetic revelation. And so when you think about this, when you think about, like even back in the 60s and 70s, most people thought, well, the Antichrist is going to be, of course, like European, you know, because we're so westernized and and, and white-centric, we think the Antichrist has to be European, and it's going to come out of Europe, a ten-nation confederation. We're going to get there one day, but I'm going to talk about what I feel, or not feel, but, but where I have uh, differing thoughts. But again, progressive prophetic revelation. So as we continue to move closer and closer towards the time in which we are going to hear the trumpet blast, we're going to be revealed more and more. So notice, as I lay the foundation, that's just the introduction, by the way. So uh, go to Revelation chapter 13. Again, you cannot know the book of Revelation without knowing the book of Daniel, okay, and vice versa. So as you get to Revelation 13, we're, we're kind of introduced to two characters that are going to be very prominent in the tribulation. Of course, God has his trinity. That is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Satan actually has his unholy trinity, and that is himself, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And so uh, there's two beasts that are introduced in Revelation chapter, chapter 13. The first one is talking about, uh, that comes out of the sea, this, this beast that comes out of the sea, is talking about the Antichrist. So uh, we're not going to talk about him just yet. So let's move on to verse 11 of chapter 13 of Revelation as we're introduced to the second beast, okay? And so it says in, in chapter 11, well then I saw another, another beast coming up out of the earth and had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Again, okay? uh, the dragon is uh, an idiom for um, Satan and of course the two horns uh, uh, like a lamb talking about the two pseudo I guess, a religious belief that's going to unite the world in an ecumenical movement to kind of believe in the same thing, okay? So we're not going to get into that right now, but notice, verse 12, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Okay, whose deadly wounds were healed. Okay, so verse 13, he performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. We're going to come back to this. And he receives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast uh, who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to this image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now notice, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has this mark on their name of the uh, this mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name and this is wisdom let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man his number is six 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 so real quick two things that we have to take note of um there's this mark right um and of course like i said uh for years and years Christians have speculated as to what this, this mark is. And I, I remember getting saved in the, the mid-90s, and I remember watching a, a production, a movie that was done in the 70s by Calvary Chapel uh, in the Maranatha 
whatever ministry and they did this apocalyptic like a uh, in time video and of course like you know some of the people that were in the tribulation had a tattoo of 666 and i was like that is like not gonna happen okay not just from a woman's standpoint like who which woman out there would actually tattoo 666 on their forehead right and so like that's just not gonna happen well guess what we moved into the 80s and of course we got this this the, the barcode that was like you know we scan everything and all the products and so people now started to to get well it's a barcode that we're gonna put on our foreheads or our right hand and all these things and so again that was like ridiculous to think that somebody is gonna and then now we have people tattooing their face and all whatever so but like that was just kind of hard, like absurd to think about right and of course they thought about the credit card and how it was the, the mark of the beast and all these things at least the utilization of the technology and of course we get to the 2000s and by that time in 1999 right before the turn of the century we had the invention uh, or the development of the RFID chip, right? Which is the radio frequency ID chip, which of course everybody's like, well, that's the mark, that's the mark, because you can actually put, implant it underneath your skin and it will keep all of your data, whether it's your, uh, your financial data or whatever, it could keep it all there. Well, guess what? I believe that's still true. I really do, especially with and now I was reading this passage and thinking about this uh, yesterday, and I thought, you know what? There's two tiers of the mark. Who, how many of us like just simply believe that there's just going to be this one overarching universal mark? Because that's what we've been told, right? But it says, what goes on the forehead, what goes on the right hand? I believe there's two tiers. I believe the first lower tier, I guess, would be the mark, which is on the right hand, which is the RFID chip which is gonna keep all of the information that is needed for the, the, the image of the beast and the antichrist to, to track you, to persecute you and all these things, right? I mean, think about the, the convergence of all the things that have happened the last 25 years for this to be able to happen. Whether you're talking about the Patriot Act, which begins to surveil the populace, all that information, right? That we're, you know, we're against, right? Remember uh, Jason Bourne identity? They had a uh, whole thing about surveillance and all these things. But the thing is, with Facebook, now we're giving away our information. That we're, uh, we're not even just like, is the government tapping our, our phone and all these things. We're giving our information, whether it's like pictures of us, now they can use it for facial recognition, or whether it's like anything, information, even I have COVID, I, People will even say that on Facebook. Well, now that information is there. Whether you're talking about, I went bankrupt, that information is there. Like, who does that? But somebody that is in the uh, two digits IQ range, I guess, right? But, but like, anyways, I'm not saying anybody specific, but, um, but we have friends that have done that. Anyway, so you have that, right? Think about Obamacare. And how many people have to go to Obamacare at healthcare.gov? Did you know every time, every year it rolls around, you have, in order for you to qualify for, for, that, for that stimulus and that, that um, I guess, assistance, you have to update your information to which you're telling the government, okay, so somebody moved in into my house. Well, this person was a step per, uh, step stepson, so they moved out. But they're, well, I was married to that person, but they're in another house. But well, their income's this, but my income. But they, and, and you're telling them, well, I, I, I divorced my my wife or my dog, whatever, whatever suits whatever person out there. And then, and you are giving them all this information willingly. And then, goodness, you guys realize that there's a company out there called Ascension that is actually partnering with Google because there's that loophole in the, uh, what a, what the Healthcare Act of 1996. They found a loophole to which they could acquire all of your medical history and, and centralize all that information. Whether it's now talking about whether you've been vaccinated or whether you've had cancer or you've had uh, a disease or whatever. Like they have, they're working on centralizing all that information. You think that no one has the right to your personal 
uh, health information, your medical history, guess what? That's being decentralized right now. And guess what? That's gonna be information that is gonna be part of the mark in which you put on your hand, on the right hand, to which you can't get a job interview, you can't uh, go on a cruise, you can't get on a plane, you can't buy groceries, because they're gonna know. It doesn't matter if you don't wanna tell anybody you've been vaccinated or whatever. Like, it, that's just it, I'll, I'll answer later. But, but that, that's just it. It's gonna be information that is there. And then at the same time, all this is going on and we're being distracted with all the, the stupid stuff. So that's the first tier. Right hand, that mark. What about the forehead? Well, the forehead is very interesting. I, I, like I said, I, I came to this conclusion yesterday. So if I haven't thought this out very nicely or very well, please forgive me. <laughs> I might come back next Sunday and say, we knew I was wrong. <laughs> so, but, the, but the forehead, I believe it's that brain to the computer interface that Elon Musk is developing. The, con the, the, the company that he started back in 2016 called Neuralink in which it's supposed to connect your brain as they insert a chip in your brain with all the neuro neurons and all the... It's supposed to connect you to the internet and to the Wi-Fi and basically make you a cyborg. Please don't bury your head in the sand. This is happening all around you. And guess what? You're safe from it because we're going to be raptured. But there's people that are going to be left behind and they're going to be slapped in the face with all this because we're not talking about it as a church. This Neuralink company wants to make you guys or make people who are left behind all cyborgs because we can't compete with artificial intelligence. It's been said that artificial intelligence will wipe out humanity in order for you to actually continue to exist. You have to become a cyborg. That's the technology that is there. Whew. Again, all this is going on. I believe that is the forehead portion. It's another tier, right? But that's just basically you connecting to the internet without any <coughs> router, without any, any phone, anything like that. Now, what about the image of the beast? Well, of course, we as a church talk so much about the mark of the beast that we, ne we didn't even try to tackle the image of the beast for a long time. And of course, I remember back in 2013 when we had that home group where we went through the book of Revelation. I started pounding my Bible and telling people, guys, you have to understand artificial intelligence, AI, that's the image of the beast. And people were like, oh, whatever, whatever. Of course, there's that uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence has always been hinted to, whether you're talking about the Terminator, whether you're talking about uh, the Matrix or whatever, it's always been hinted to, right? Except we think that that's stupid because we know and we pass by and we have people that own Teslas and, and they're self-driving. Well, guess what? That's artificial intelligence in that car learning how to drive. We have. Um, um, I guess um, even like Syria and different things like that. Uh, you know, th these are artificial intelligence. It's all around us, but people say, well, like, so what? Like, well, so what? Well, here's the thing. I'm not saying Tesla is going to take over the world. Like that one little car that, that Tommy owns, okay? Now, I'm not saying that. That's AI. That, that's, that's the artificial intelligence that's very narrow, that's called narrow AI, in which it could only learn one subject. There's now the development of what's called AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, which is almost like a person being born, sent to preschool, sent to first grade, sent to second grade, as we continue to learn everything around us, even football, even mathematics, even ge ge geometry or whatever, ge you know, whatever, right? This artificial general intelligence is designed to, to, to be like a person to learn everything. And the goal is 
ASI, which is artificial super intelligence, which every single subject that needs to be known on the earth, they become an expert. Whether you're talking about an expert like Einstein or Stephen Hawking, they become an expert, in fact, far exceeding the Einsteins and the Stephen Hawkings. Please don't bury your head in the sand. This is all happening around us. Jesus talks about it, and, and, and Daniel talks about it, and John talks about it. This is something that is happening. This is something that one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, whoa, how close are we? It's okay for the church because it says in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, we're going to be taken, right? One last thing, as I was looking at this yesterday, and it says this, he makes fire come down from heaven and on the earth in the sight of men. I remember the conversation I have, uh, I have with a friend in this week about weather manipulation and weather modification. Do you, not, do, do you realize that that's, that's French stuff? At least the, the, the mainstream people say that's French stuff, but that's not French. Weather modification, or you could call it cloud seeding, or you could call it geoengineering, these are things that are happening and has been happening for two decades. Do you realize my one evidence, I have many evidences to this, but my one evidence is the Communist Chinese Party. Do you realize how did they, 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 they score the Beijing Olympics in 2008 with the Olympic Committee? Do you realize in that part of the, the, the world, in the summer, that's the rainy season. It's called typhoon season. Do you, do you know what typhoon means? Da feng. Da feng means big wind. That's what we call it, da feng, big wind, typhoon season, where it's supposed to rain almost throughout. How did they get the Olympic Committee to, to allow them to have the Beijing Olympics there in 2008? Because they were able to promise good weather. Promise! How? Through cloud seeding, geoengineering, weather modification, because you go back to the Olympics in 2008, pristine weather around Beijing, that is. Why do I bring this up? Because here it says that he even makes, the, the Antichrist even makes fire to come down from heaven and the earth. I looked it up. I'm not an expert in Greek. I don't even stay at a Holiday Inn. I just looked it up, and it says the word for fire is pyre. Pyre, which on 4th of July we set off fireworks, which is called pyrotechnic, right? That word in the Greek is not just fire, it's lightning. Look it up. Be a student, be a Berean, look it up. Don't just trust me. Pyre, that is lightning, like Thor with his... Uh, with his yomir or whatever, nyomir. I forget which way it goes, but like, that's what it is. The false prophet is going to be able to deceive because he's going to be able to call lightning as this technology has already progressed to an nth degree. If we saw that clearing of the skies in, uh, above Beijing back in 2008, what do you think they could do now? And I'm not just talking about the, the Chinese, uh, the Communist Chinese Party. Almost every government in the world is into this. Don't be blinded. Don't be blindsided. And don't be narrow-minded. I only believe this because the Bible also says it. Now, if the Bible doesn't say it, and you come to me and, and do what, say all this, I'd be like, whatever, right? But because the Bible says it. 3,500 years ago, and then about 1,900 years ago with the, with the Apostle John with the book of Revelation, this stuff is real, guys. Open up your eyes. Open up your eyes, because the day is coming. The day is drawing near in which we are going to be taken up. We're going to be snatched. The word in the Greek is harpazo. In the Latin, it's rapturo. 
That's what that's what we get the word rapture because it's it's kind of weird to say we're going to be hard pots. <laughs> I mean, you know, the English. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be hard pots. Right? That just doesn't sound right. Right? We're going to be raptured. Right? So, that's us. Open up your eyes. And as we continue with this 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 series, please understand all that you're going through. When, when the Bible talks about faith and hope and all these things, it's not just a blind hope or blind trust. Almost everywhere in the Bible where it talks about the Christian having hope, it's always linked to the coming of Jesus or the church. Do your homework. Look at the word hope in the New Testament, and somewhere around those verses, you'll find a mention of the rapture. At least uh, uh, an in, uh, implying of the rapture. Again, that's our hope, guys. So, before I end, let's go to Ge uh, Genesis 11. Genesis 11. And of course, there we have the, the, the Tower of Babel given to us, right? And of course, verse 1 says, the whole world had one language and one speech. And of course, now we have that one language, which is binary. And at the same time, we have... Anyways, now it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found themselves in the plain of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And, and they have brick for stone, and they have asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city in the tower whose top is to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So we're going to talk about this hopefully next Sunday as we relate it to what's going on in Europe with sun. So, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men have built. And the Lord says, indeed, the people are one and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Again, not that God was scared or anything like that, or he was actually uh, kind of like uh, vacationing and also he came back and found this to be happening. No. Anyways, this is just a narrative. This is just a storytelling. And so describing God in, in, in kind of like an anthropomorphic kind of way. And so, uh, so basically you have this and he says, you know, this, now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. That is the verse I want you guys to circle to under, underline. Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Again, the book of Judges says every man did what was right in their own eyes. But there was a judge, there could be a nation that God could, could bring to, to judge them. Now, at this time, in Genesis 11 is similar to where we live today in which technology and, and one language, the binary language and all these things, nothing that man is going to propose will be withheld from them. Not that we're going to become God. Again, that is man's ultimate goal is to become God, to become a like God or to become immortal. That's, that's man's goal. You look at the money in Silicon Valley, and all, all the richest people in the world, they are all funding research to live forever, right? And so here you have this statement. So he says, come, let us go down there and confuse the language. And you know the story. Well, guess what? God's not going to confuse the language this time. He's already said. He did it once, twice actually with the flood. Now he's going to come down, take his church, and pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. Then seven years later, he's going to come triumphantly on a horse and establish his millennial reign. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. We cannot waver from this. We cannot because this is what people are going to face uh, once we're taken out of here. So, again, he says, let's go down there because if we don't, Nothing that man proposes will be withheld from them. And I'm not talking about immortality. I'm talking about bestiality. I'm talking about all sorts of perversion out there. 
solve it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you placed us here, just like you placed Esther at a certain time for such a time as this. And I just pray that we would all understand the times in which we live in and realize that we've been given a great commission to take this message elsewhere, to warn people, to be a watchman on the wall. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together. Um, let's sing, uh, close with singing Blessed Be the Name. It's on the guitar on the back there for you. Is it?